All right. So let me, okay, let me rephrase that and then we can start. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Linda Rashki, you've been, you, you're the author of Trading Sardians, uh, Lessons in the Markets from a Long Life Trader. Um, you've been trading for 38 years now. And I think you were also featured in Market Wizards. So just tell us what has been your thing that has made you that consistent and profitable and a respected um, person in the trading industry? Well, just to set the record straight, I take losses too, <laughs> and I have losing weeks and losing months too. So, um, you know, as, as far as the consistency goes, I think so much of that comes with experience, you know, and it just takes a long, long time. I think so much longer than everybody realizes. So, for example, if you were just starting out learning golf, but you aspired to be a professional golf player or a professional tennis player, how many years do you think it would take for you to get consistent in your game, let alone, you know, actually make money, you know, playing professionally? But it, it's really not much different than you know, playing a musical instrument or, you know, dancing ballet or playing a sport or um, any performance oriented discipline takes a lot of, a lot of time to get to know yourself, different techniques, changing conditions. If you're going to be a, a tennis player, you have to learn to play on clay, grass, you know, uh, you know, indoors, outdoors. And so the same thing with the markets, you need to see bull markets, bear markets, high volatility, low volatility, different markets. There's so many things to learn. I mean, even if you're going to become a doctor, you do regular university, then you do medical school, then you do uh, residency, and you know it could take 10 years before you can actually go out and make money as a professional doctor. And even then, there's so many different disciplines, right? You know, so I think people need to put a realistic framework around their expectations for trading because it is so easy to get into the business. You just need a computer, a screen, an account that's modestly funded, and a mouse, you know, and you're, <laughs> boom, you can click and, and make real money or lose real money. And um, I don't think people quite recognize all the little challenges along the way that happen psychologically. So back to me, how did I overcome that and you have to keep in mind that I started on the trading floor in the op options pits, you know, so mm. I was making markets in equity options. So there you have a very definite strategy and there was a bit more edge in those days. There's no edge anymore. You know, you could look to do certain spreads and when you're on the floor, you get a sense of the order flow, the volumes, the ebb and flow of the day's cycle. So in that respect, you know, I had a learning environment where I had, pro you know, professionals all around me and I could see what the successful people were doing. And I think that helped a lot, you know, as well as having the person that backed me had very strict routine and and even then when I went on to Philadelphia and found somebody else to back me because it takes a while to make enough money to go out on your own um, I had really good examples of just how much work it took you know even that you're you're on the floor during the day right which could just be eight or nine hours you still get into work an hour too early review your sheets you know do, do a lot of preparation and then at night, even though we are on the exchange floor, at night we're doing one or two hours of work every night. And so this was ever since like 1981, 82. And it's just a sheer amount of hours that, um, you know, what is it? The um, There's a book or something about 10,000 hours, you know, we have yeah. to do 10,000 hours to become proficient in something. And 
that means if you traded every day, you know, maybe take a month off for vacation or two weeks off for vacation, but if you did every day, it's, it's at least six years before you build up that 10,000 hours. And everybody expects to be successful in two years, you know? So it's reframing your expectations. And then what you find is that you do it because you love it, not because you're looking to necessarily make money, but because it's like a puzzle and you wanna figure out the pieces and you wanna see if you can create something new or different. And you might try a hundred things and maybe it only one of them works, you know, but you have to enjoy that process as well as have a ridiculous amount of time, you know, where you can just sit down and spend hours, you know, in front of the screen or studying charts or whatever it might be. So that's a long worded um, answer to your question on becoming consistent and becoming profitable, but it is truly a function of 10,000 hours at a minimum. Okay, and uh, Kali did mention that you, you're somewhat retired right now, but I, I guess you still trade because I see your tweets here on and off. So I guess, you know, once a trader, always a trader, is that the case for you? Yeah, yeah, you know, I still, um, I'm still in front of my screens at 7, a.m. Eastern time and then I'm finished at 4 p.m. and then I'm back in for two hours every evening and when I retired I meant that I retired from my hedge fund. I had been a money man, a CTA for many years um, with a commodity fund. I, I traded just strictly futures in my pool and um, and I was also the CPO, so I founded the fund and started it, and we had like 150 million, which is respectable. I mean, it's not like a Paul Tudor Jones, but it was respectable and did really good performance. And um, so I retired thinking that I was going to not trade and just train my horses, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that got really boring after like three months and nobody oh, else was around, you know, I'm like, I love, oh God. <laughs> I love horses too. I do. Oh, lovely, lovely. You know, any animals, there's just something about dogs, you know, cats, animals, horses that help take the stress away, you know, from an intense day. So that's important to me is to find some outlet to get rid of the stress. If you, you, you like to run, that's marvelous. You know, some people like to garden or play tennis or do something, but um, yes, yes. So I, uh, I, I found myself back in front of the screens and, you know, I have a little online uh, community on Skype. There's two or three of us, you know, that have been friends for 20 years. So I, at least I have company, you know, to make jokes with in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Linda, let's go into the book. Um, what was the inspiration for writing the book? And what, what would you say that is, um, I know we're gonna, you know, get into some questions on the book, but generally, what would you say is in the book that can really impact the modern day trader? Well, you know, it's funny because I actually have had six books outlined from like 15 years ago. I just never found the time to write a book because you can't write books and trade, not not well. You know, you can't do either one well. They're both really full-time endeavors. So um, it started off with a little bit of a dare by my daughter because she had to finish up her master's recital. Uh, she's doing opera and she um, had graduated from her master's program five years earlier and she only had like three months left where she could do her master's recital so we made this bet like I'm like okay you study your you, you know your uh, material and your repertoire and you put something together and I will write my book you know and it started off sort of like a little bit just getting my thoughts down on paper because I'm not very great with words you know, it took a lot of work to study how to make something really funny, you know, and entertaining, uh, but yet of value. So initially I, I um, 
it, it, it took it took another two years, you know. <laughs> so she won the contest, obviously, you know, in three months. Mm-hmm. But um, in that process, she said, you know, here's some ways that you need to study how to write. This is my daughter teaching me. Um, Stephen King wrote a book called On Writing. And so I read that. And then I ordered more books. And then I... Uh, sh- I I needed a little bit of life to the book, and she said, well, you know, you should read David Sadakis, or Sad- yeah, that's his name. He's like an American humorist. And then I got into this genre of reading all these American humorists, you know, like 12 different books. And then mm-hmm. just taking time to really expand my horizon. I, I must have read like 20 books just trying to get my arms around how do people write something that's so entertaining to read that you can't put it down? Because I wrote my first manuscript, which is about half the length that the book is now, and it was all written in the narrative, you know? And I was thinking to myself, well, it makes sense to me, but I don't even like reading my own book, you know? <laughs> I can't do this. So I had to completely rewrite everything. And I said to my daughter, I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about hiring an editor, a ghostwriter, somebody to help show me the way, which sounds silly, but let me give you an example. Um, If you're writing in the narrative, you might say something like, it was cold outside, the temperature dropped 10 degrees, the snow was piled three feet high, the man was walking to his car. You know, that's a really boring thing. To read so instead they always say show don't tell don't tell the reader show and let them imagine in their mind so you say he left the building nearly slipping on the steps and pulled his collar up tightly around his neck as his ears started burning with the red wind chill you know something like that so it it draws a vivid picture and um, so then I sent that, I, I didn't hire uh, anybody, but my daughter said, Mommy, let me see if I can rewrite some and show you the way. So she, she took my manuscript and rewrote the first chapter, the first three chapters, and it is hysterically funny. And then she proceeded to go through a divorce, change jobs, sell her house, do all this stuff, and all of a sudden, like, my buddy came to a halt <laughs> I'm like oh Erica you have to you have to write some more I want to find out what happens to me you know <laughs> but <laughs> but she never did so I'm like damn I'm gonna have to figure this out myself you know yeah. so I reworked it reworked it and then I had like several people that I would bounce it off of so I sent the um the manuscript to Brett Steenbarger, who's a really good friend he's a trading coach he's like you know I'd like to see little lessons at the end of every story and then I sent it to somebody else and they're like well I want to know what you were feeling when you lost that much money because by the way the book is really about um I felt like I was always on the wrong side of every outlier or every bad event that would happen and have huge overnight losses (laughs) it was really it was really bad. And then my whole career has been that way, you know? So you read these books and people are like, oh yes, I made this great trade. And they start pounding their chest and they're like, look, I bought here and I sold here and I made $5,000 in one hour, you know, (laughs) or something silly. You know, it's like these people are silly because when I was on the trading floor, I learned very quickly that the best traders do not talk about their wins, never. They keep great poker faces. And the only people that would ever brag about having a winning day or a, a, a good trade were the ones that had so few good trades. <laughs> you know, they had to actually brag yeah. that they made a good trade, you know? I'm yeah. like, oh, gosh. So, um, and you see the same thing all over the Internet, too. It's it's just, you know, the way human nature likes to work because, every you know, everybody has egos and gratification so I'm like well I'm going to take it the opposite tact and tell every bad thing you know that happens in this business because then it's inspiring that hey if I can make back these losses anybody can you know I mean and not only that you find that trading is a process of making back losses 
year after year, week after week. You know, it's when you play a tennis game, you don't win every point, nor do you win every match, you know, but you play consistently enough and, and maybe, you know, you'll win two or three big titles out of the 20 big, you know, rounds that there are. So, um, it, it ended it up and, and then I ended up going into all my old notebooks and just looking at things that I had learned from people along the way that were senior to me at the time. For example, Ned Davis is probably one of the top researchers in the country. You know, he sold his research firm for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. But I totally respect the work that he does. You know, and I had gotten to know him through some conferences in the MTA, and so I had taken some notes on one really inspiring talk that he gave, and um, so I include like that in there. And then Mike Epstein, who has passed, he was a friend who was um, in the markets for 50 years on the floor, and he ended up heading up MIT's financial engineering lab. You know, so this whole chapter devoted to him and his stories, and so... It's like all the little pearly words of wisdom that I learned along the way that were of value um, from other people are in that book, you know, as well as like little lessons. And then I'll just give you an example of a really bad thing that happened to me. And this was when I had my fund. And um, it was one of those weeks that it was a very very sloppy week in the market and it just wasn't acting well at all and you know all the signs of a top were there and the market was starting to roll over and i put on a short position on friday afternoon of 600 s p futures and 600 russell futures and in those days the russell was the big contract so it was a really big contract but i had this cracked molar that had just been causing me pain all day so I was able to get into the dentist in the last hour of the day (laughs) to go sit there and get my tooth fixed so I'm sitting in the dentist chair and my phone rings and I see that it's Judd who worked for me and he's I I couldn't talk you know because I'm all numb and it's all propped open but I picked it up and he's like Linda Linda the the spy you know the spies are you know that's the proxy for the, uh, the S&P futures and they trade a little bit longer than the S&P futures do they trade for a full, they traded for a full hour after the close in those days because it's up 20 points which was like huge you know huge in those days so that was the day that the Fed had announced that they were going to take over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac you know this is in the financial debacle uh, period 10 years ago and (laughs) you know after the close and there's nothing that you can do you just put on the biggest short position of your life precisely an hour before the Fed announces that they are going to come and bail everybody out you see so I'm like what do you do I'm sitting there it's Friday the markets are closed I'm like I can't believe it and so Sunday night you know the S&P futures everything opened up like 40 points higher and instantly it was like a four million dollar loss you know so i'm i'm like wow really you know really how does you know and this this happens time and time again throughout my career so you just have to sit there and say all right let me see what am i going to do about this well obviously i have to get smaller because anytime you have a your back up against the wall you have to get down to the point where you can trade freely you know you're not worrying about making something good out of the position or bad out of the position you're worrying about getting smaller so that you can preserve your capital and then get back to trading so i'm thinking well i'll reduce my position in half which i did and then um i i figured it out i'm like well if i make you know i, f- I forget what it was two hundred thousand dollars every day you know for the rest of the month or you know whatever it was um yeah i think it was like two hundred thousand dollars every day I can make back my loss, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, whether or not I can actually do that is a different story, but you have to, like, put it into manageable bites, you know, to see, well, what would it take? And um, now, mind you, keep in mind, I'm trading a fund. This is not my personal mm-hmm. account, per se. Yeah. So, um, but it's still, you know, I didn't grow up in a wealthy neighborhood, you know. It's still a lot of money, you know. I'm choking <laughs> on it, you know. So, as it turns out, you know, I got smaller. There was a lot of volatility, a lot of opportunity. You know, I could breathe. 
you know, they, they opened Sunday night, did a little trading, um, Monday morning, you know, the markets were swinging and I could do some more trading, trade around the position, you know, and then wait till I could put more back on. And I actually made back that loss in five days, if you can believe that. And I went on to end that month up 3%, you know, on, a, you know, a significant size fund. So it's, but I have a lot of stories like that, just like, you yeah. know, it, it, it's, what do you, you want to say it's bad luck, but I'll tell you one thing, one thing that's really interesting. David Hand is a mathematician who wrote this book um, called The Improbability Theory. Um, he used to teach at a university up in the northeast, and then he got hired by Winton, who is one of the world's largest hedge funds. So obviously he must be pretty astute if one of the world's largest hedge funds hired him. Yeah. But he said... Yeah, he said, I, okay, I'll come work for you, but I have to finish this book. And in this book, he explains the math behind why these improbable events actually do happen. And if you put it in the context of, I made 10,000 trades over my career, and eight of them were like killer, you know, killer memorable bad trades, you know, outliers where you just get whacked on huge gaps and, and just horrible, like... <laughs> random things you know having a huge size position on being short euro dollars when the plane hits the world trade center and everything blows up and they close the market and it's shut down for five days and then of course euro dollars open up so much higher you know just crazy things like that so but if you put it in the context that if i made ten thousand trades eight of them are going to be huge ridiculous outlier gaps then all of a sudden the probability that this horrible things happen to me seems not so improbable you see and that's yeah, what life is actually uh nasim taleb says in his book that um those are like black swan events and that you know they don't happen every so often so i don't think they should like hinder you from doing what you normally do though losing a lot of money in that case would shock anyone you know everyone um but you know going back to the losses uh, a little bit would you say uh, because you you have made your losses but you have always found a way to you know make back those losses and you know um do you feel unlucky when you make those losses and um you know in your book you talk about how you make back the losses can you tell us you know how you do that by step by step? well first of all I never think of it as lucky or unlucky. If I have a good winning trade, I always say, well, I got really lucky. And the luck comes from having done your preparation and homework and you were there to capitalize on an opportunity. I never say that I'm unlucky. I always say I'm accountable for everything that happens. If I wasn't, I wouldn't be in this business. I take responsibility for my account, for my client's account, for whatever it might be. And of course, if it's this random outside event, it just is part of the game. You have mm -hmm. to understand that if you can't tolerate these types of unpredictable things, you should not be a trader because this is the stuff that happens. This is real life. I mean, if I'll, I'll send you the book and I promise you will not believe the stuff that happens. You'll be like, oh, you gotta be making that up. And I'm like, no, this is all stuff that happened. And if you can't accept that there is risk in this business, that's what you're dealing with. You're, you're, you know, it's risk. So think about an insurance company are they unlucky because a hurricane hit the east coast of the United States and they have to pay out all these claims? No, that's their business. You know, they know that every once in a while there's going to be a bad event that they can't control and they will have exposure to it. And so the same thing is with trading. You will have exposure. Now, there are ways to limit your exposure. You can limit your exposure by the degree of leverage that you use or by the amount of time that you're in the marketplace obviously a scalper who gets in and takes a trade and gets out in three minutes is going to have very little time exposure where there could be an event so there's ways that you can limit it but you understand this is the nature of the business yeah 
So um, let's talk about how you manage your risk a little bit. How do you, based on your strategy, um, and I read somewhere, I don't know if the book was right, uh, that you do pattern recognition. Is that right? That's um, that's a pretty broad term. You know, I, I if I had to, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a technician, so I just stick to technicals. I don't look at the fundamentals. I'm a big believer in structure and um, the type of structure that I look at is the exact same type of structure as if you were looking at a swing chart. So I like to look at the length of the swings and the swing highs and swing lows because that's where you tend to see the most volume, whether it's on an hourly chart or a daily chart. And obviously recognize the trend. So where are you going to get your most bang for your buck? Probably trading in the direction of the supply demand imbalance, which may be in a nice trending market, or if there's a trading range, recognizing the tests of the upper and lower ends of the range, or when a swing is getting radically extended, um, perhaps the pattern recognition part might be, you know, a rising wedge or a divergence, a momentum divergence. Uh, so the basic structure part is easy. The tricky part is always framing it out, you know, how am I going to decide when and where to enter? Um, am I going to enter via a stop and let the market pull me in? Well, if I do that, I'm giving away trade location. But I can get in earlier and have much better trade location, but then the odds are that it might, you know, it may or may not actually break out. So everything is like a little puzzle. There's not a right or wrong answer. There's not a right or wrong style, but it is a matter of style. So it depends. Are you a conservative trader? or are you a more aggressive trader? And there's not a right or wrong. Everybody ends up having their own style. And then the other part of the equation is managing the trade. And that's not necessarily about where do you place your stop. It's can you keep a core position on in certain more lucrative opportunities and stay with that trade? Um, can you use more leverage, you know, when you might get that one out of every 20 cases where the stars line up and really go in and, and, and tee it up when you know that you've got that tiger by the tail. So there's a lot of little nuances with regards to that. And the best answer I can give is whatever somebody chooses to do, with the style, do it consistently. If you want to manage your trades by trailing stops, do that all the time. If you want to manage your trades by taking partial and you know seeing if you can get better on the balance, you know, but don't pick and choose and change it up and say, okay, this time I'm going to do this, this time I'm going to do that, um, because it's it's very stressful then. Um, you're like a rat in the cage and you never know if you're going to get shocked or not. You know, it's better just to be, this is my game. This is my methodology. This is how I play it. And that eliminates the stress of trying to make too many decisions and allows you to just focus on the markets more. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Good okay. answer. Yeah. So after you left the trading exchange floor, did your style of trading change and also in that regard is your trading style um a reflection of your personality by extension um when i left the trading floor when i was on the floor i was trading primarily equity options although i started trading the s p futures the very first day they were listed so i'd trade those from the floor and then when I left the floor, what happened right after that was the crash of 1987. And after 1987, 
the volumes in the equity options dried up a lot and I started trading more and more futures so 88 89 I was pretty much doing more financial futures meaning the bonds and um, the index futures and the metals and then I by 90 I was starting to do uh, grains and and you know other futures and all of them were a learning experience you know I had to learn the hard way on just about all of them because not all markets behave the same. For example, I can remember I used to always update my charts by hand and plot my oscillator by hand. I mean, I did this for 10 years because we didn't have computers that had, you know, the same displays that we do now. And I think that was also very instrumental to my learning was having to do everything by hand. It really goes to a different part of the brain when you take a pen or pencil to paper. This is documented. It, it goes to a different part of the brain than if you're just staring at your screen and fiddling with indicators on there. It's not the same thing. So I think that really helped a lot in terms of getting a feel and understanding um, just the way things moved. And so I, I'll, I'll tell you this funny story though. I was very used to the oscillator and the bar charts for the stock market futures okay the, and they trade quite differently because they have a lot more play there tend to be a little bit more swings it's a more mature market stocks are a mature market you have sure. institutionals retails a lot of different composition if you go to a market like a new emerging market the rubber market, you know, it will tend to be extremely trendly, trendy, trendy. Okay, so I started trading cotton. Don't ask me why. It was just one of my charts from my charting service. And I'll tell you, that thing trended and trended and trended and trended. And I was on the wrong side of it. It was trending down. And I kept on thinking that I was seeing buy divergences, right? <laughs> and oh it kept on God. running me over. And it was the most horrible learning experience. I, I, I never wanted to trade cotton again. I was like, oh, my gosh, I do not get this market at all. And then, you know, it's, again, an eye-opener okay you know every market has its own little personalities there are common denominators for sure but um yeah so i just gravitated more and more towards futures and then um i think it was 91 or 92 i decided to become a cta and um that that's how it started there <laughs>